Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me. We are already 58 participants. So with your permission, we would like to start our today event. We encourage you to turn on your cameras to have a more interactive uh, discussion today, if that allows. Uh, my name is Oksana Machuka. I am working for UNDP Istanbul Regional Hub as a Regional Human Mobility Advisor. But today I am here in my capacity as a co-chair of the Regional Network on Migration for Europe and Central Asia, which I am co-chairing together with my colleagues from IOM and UNHCR. Before we move forward with our first session, I would like to remind you that we have translation options. At the bottom of your screen, you will have uh, the interpretation button, please choose the Russian or English language uh, which you prefer for this event. And now allow me with your permission to welcome you to our today event, the GCM talk on indicators for Europe and North America. This event is organized by the UN Network on Migration Workstream on development of a proposed limited set of indicators to review the progress related to the GCM implementation. And it is part of a series of cross-regional and global consultations. We have today already 64 participants. We have member states and other relevant stakeholders. And we hope to have a good discussion to enhance our joint understanding of the indicators development processes, methodology, and progress of the work stream. Now, the primary goal of the event is specifically that one, to inform you about that, but also to see how the work stream has worked in developing the preliminary proposal for a limited set of indicators, which was also shared with you uh, beforehand. We very much hope to have a good discussion in this regard. Hence, your contributions will be vital today in refining the selection process and your insights on regional nuances will play a crucial role in achieving this goal. To that end, I would like to remind you to keep your microphone off this first session will not imply a Q&A session. However, if there is something you would like to share with us during this session, do not hesitate to use the chat in the right part of your screen and share your suggestions, ideas, or questions, and we can address them at the later stage. So today, I would like to guide you now through our today agenda. We will hear presentations from the UN Network on Migration Secretariat, which are the co-leads of the work stream on indicators, IOM and Andesa. We will also, uh, which by the way, have played a key role in the development of indicators. And uh, we will also have a keynote speaker from the Colgate University and International Union for the Scientific Study of Population. And last but not least, we will also hear from the International Trade Union Confederation, which uh, who are also a member of the work stream. With this being said, Allow me to give the floor to Ms. Catherine Barwise, who is the Senior Program Manager from the UN United Nations Network on Migration Secretariat to deliver the welcoming remarks. Dear Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Oksana. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this regional consultation on indicators for measuring progress in the implementation of the GCM which is part of a series of regional GCM talks taking, taking place this week. Uh, today, we're concluding our consultations here with, with the, the European North America region. So we're pleased to see the unwavering commitment of member states and stakeholders in generating momentum for the follow-up to the IMRF progress declaration. Today, we're meeting to take stock of the progress made by the network's work stream, responding to paragraph 70 of the progress declaration, which encompasses two things. First, a proposal for a limited set of indicators, and second, a comprehensive strategy for improving disaggregated migration data, as requested by member states. This gathering seeks to foster dialogue and collaboration among member states and stakeholders. We aim to facilitate meaningful discussions that will contribute to refining the proposal for a limited set of indicators. We'll have more opportunities to do so through the global consultations that will take place later this year. The revised proposal following these consultations will inform the Secretary General's report in 2024. 
The Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration is a comprehensive and essential framework aimed at addressing the complexities of global migration, fostering cooperation among nations and upholding the rights and well-being of migrants. Incorporating indicators to gauge the GCM's implementation is a groundbreaking step towards enhancing transparency and advancing robust, timely and reliable data on migration. It will also allow for comparison over time and across regions. The indicators hold promise for evidence-based decision-making and reporting. And implementing these indicators would enable member states to assess their progress against GCM principles, identify areas for improvement and foster a collective understanding of successes, gaps in capacity and challenges. Nevertheless, it's vital to approach this process considering the diverse perspectives of migration across different regions, whilst acknowledging each country's social and economic environment and capacities. In this challenging task, I'd like to salute the exceptional dedication and hard work of the co-leads of the work stream, UNDESA and IOM. Their unwavering commitment to inclusivity and creating spaces for collaboration and dialogue has really driven this meaningful progress in identifying the preliminary proposal. Likewise, I'd like to acknowledge the invaluable contributions of the Workstream members and thank them for their constructive engagement. The Workstream reflects the true essence of our network community, benefiting from a wide range of technical expertise and representing the diversity and collaborative spirit of our partnerships across the UN system and stakeholders. The preliminary proposal for a limited set of indicators built on the wealth of indicators already available, including the SDG Global Indicator Framework. The proposal aims to create a more effective and coherent approach by leveraging efforts existing efforts and knowledge, and many countries are already producing and collecting data to understand trends and the situation of migrants, their vulnerabilities and how to improve their integration and well-being. By aligning GCM indicators with existing processes, countries can build upon existing data collection systems and reporting mechanisms, maximizing the impact of migration policies on sustainable development and promoting inclusive strategies that benefit both migrants and host communities. It also allows nations to work together, learn from one another, and build a more compassionate and cooperative approach to migration. Member state involvement is vital in ensuring the relevance, measurability, and comparability of these indicators. And therefore, we really encourage your active participation and insights on how regional contexts should be reflected in their selection. And I encourage you also to reflect and recognize the unique challenges and opportunities specific to Europe and North America. Regional perspectives should inform the choice of indicators to be included in this limited set, thus ensuring a more accurate and contextually relevant proposal that resonates with the global and regional landscapes. Let us seize this opportunity and work together constructively to ensure that the limited set of indicators is relevant for Europe and North America, as well as other regions, that migrant stories are made visible, and that the proposal meets the needs of decision makers for informed migration policies in the region and beyond. And Thank you so much for all your participation and commitment to this significant process. Over to you, Oksana. Thank you very much, Katie. And thank you for reminding us once again about the importance of the GCM, about its global context, but specifically why it is important to have these indicators developed, especially to have well-informed decisions made at the regional and global level. Um, with this being said, I would like to move on to our next uh, speakers. And today we will hear from two experts that have been co-leading the activities of the work stream. And thank you, Katie, also for mentioning them and the key role that they have played throughout this process. Uh, they will provide an overview of the indicators development process and methodology. And first, I would like to welcome Ms. Siran Schoberger, a data and research officer at IOM Global Migration Data Analysis Center. Uh, Ms. Schopberger has more than 10 years of experience in conducting analysis and research on migration and development trends and policies. And next, we will have Ms. Claire Menozzi, a Population Affairs Officer at the Population Division of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA. Ms. Menozzi has nearly 20 years of experience in analyzing migration trends and policies estimating migrant stocks, refining concepts and definitions related to migration statistics. And an important element is that 
that I would like to share is that she also played a critical role in the development of the SDG indicator 1072, which is the number of countries with policies to facilitate orderly, safe, regular, and responsible migration and mobility of people. We hope that today's presentations will provide us with valuable insights into the development process and methodology of indicators for the GCM, and will enhance our understanding of the approach taken and the element considered in this process. With this being said, DM Schoberger, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Oksana. Good afternoon and welcome also from my side. It is a pleasure to be with you today to discuss the progress on the work stream activities and the preliminary proposal of a limited set of indicators to review progress on the Global Compact on Migration Implementation. Before I start my presentation, I would like to thanks uh, to extend my thanks to Johan Dessa on behalf of IOM for the great collaboration during the past months, to the UN Migration Network Secretariat for the amazing support, and also to the members of the work stream for the constructive engagement and the insightful comments over the past months. Let us now perhaps start with the presentation so that we can provide you with an overview of uh, the activities of the past months on the methodology that we followed um, to develop uh, the set of indicators and also on the preliminary proposal and its components. Next slide, please. As was mentioned by our speakers at the beginning of this meeting, Workstream 1 was established to address paragraph 70 of the IMRF uh, Progress Declaration. Through this paragraph, member states uh, request the Secretary General to propose for the consideration of member states uh, a limited set of indicators uh, to assist member states upon their request uh, in conducting inclusive reviews of progress related to the implementation of the Global Compact, as well as to include a comprehensive strategy for improving disaggregated migration data at the local, national, regional, and global levels. And uh, as we see from this paragraph, there are two main deliverables that the World Stream is working on, and we can see them in the next slide. The first one is related to the development of a limited set of indicators, and it is uh, uh, the aspect on which the World Stream is working this year. We have started by conducting a mapping of relevant approaches to measure migration governance in general, and with a specific focus on the Global Compact. We have developed a discussion note with a proposal for a limited set of indicators. And we are currently conducting consultations with member states and different stakeholders so that we could integrate their feedback. Next year, the work stream will then work on the development of a strategy to improve migration data disaggregation. Next slide, please. In this slide, you can see an overview of the process that the work stream followed to identify the preliminary proposal of the limited set of indicators. And as we will see in the next slides, we started with a canvassing questionnaire. We then conducted a mapping of existing frameworks and indicators in two steps. And finally, we developed the proposal based on the previous steps. Next slide, please. At the beginning of the year, as a work stream, we decided to um, launch a questionnaire for member states and stakeholders in order to better understand what are their needs, what are their priorities, and also their perspectives with regard to the scope of the set of indicators that the work stream was about to start developing. We received almost 100 responses, of which one third were submitted by government entities, and we received responses from all regions of the world. Respondents told us with their answers that they think that the limited set should be used to monitor progress over time, that it should incorporate the guiding principles of the Global Compact, that it should be used to inform evidence-based policymaking, that it would be important that it has an agreed methodology, and that it should, it should also be a, a useful tool to highlight gaps in the implementation of the Global Compact. 
And the uh, results, such as those that we just saw, and those ADEX um, that um, came from the canvassing questionnaire, were very useful for the um, work stream because we use them to structure our methodology and also the criteria for which we assess the indicators, as we will see in the next slides. So, next slide, please. We um, then uh, decided to look at uh, um, existing approaches to monitor migration governance. Um, and we decided to do so in line with paragraph 70 of the progress declaration, which uh, um, requests that the set of indicators uh, is developed building on uh, um, the SDG indicator frameworks and other frameworks. And also because most of the respondents to the questionnaire told us that they, they think that it would be important that the set of indicators built on, built on existing uh, mandates and processes. We identified 31 indicator frameworks relevant for migration governance and the global compact. And of these 16 were developed by academic or research institutions, three by civil society organizations, and 12 by international organizations or through processes that have been facilitated by international organizations. And once we identified the 31 frameworks, we compared them. And we did so based on five criteria that we can see in the next slide. So in this uh, slide, you can see an overview of the comparison criteria that we used for mapping one. And as a reminder, these were identified based on uh, questionnaire responses and also on the text of paragraph 70. First, we looked at whether or not frameworks have been endorsed intergovernmentally. And we did so um, in line with uh, paragraph 70 and questionnaire responses, but also because frameworks that have been endorsed intergovernmentally often undergo a higher level of uh, scrutiny with regard to their scope, relevance and with regard to their metadata. We then uh, looked at the relevance for countries belonging to different regions and income levels in order to ensure a voluntary yet also global approach and also to make sure that we um, work with uh, frameworks that are relevant for countries and regions worldwide. And this was also considered an important criterion by most uh, um, survey respondents. We then looked at the availability of a time series because paragraph 70 requests that the set is used to monitor progress over time. And also most respondents said that this would be an important uh, aspect to consider. And in order to uh, monitor progress over time, we need to have data available for at least uh, two points in time. Then we also looked at the criterion of timeliness and particularly at uh, whether frameworks have data available for the year of adoption of the Global Compact 2018 and for the following years. And finally, we uh, assessed the number of uh, guiding principles of the Global Compact covered because most respondents to the survey told us that they think that guiding principles should be uh, incorporated in the proposal. Next slide, please. Based on this first mapping, we identified seven frameworks that meet four or five criteria. We have two frameworks that meet all five criteria and that are also endorsed intergovernmentally. And these are the SDG indicator frameworks, uh, and also the UN expert group on migration statistics indicators. And then we had five other frameworks that are not endorsed intergovernmentally, but met all the other four criteria. And these are the Commitment to Development Index, the EMISEM indicators, which is an academic framework, the Global Compact on Refugees indicator framework, the IDAC guidelines on indicators for children on the move and the migration governance indicators. Next slide, please. 
We then um, looked um, at the indicators that are included in these uh, seven indicator frameworks. Um, and uh, um, we also uh, added a limited number of new indicators that were suggested by members of the world stream because they considered them to be important due to their uh, relevance for um, some GCM objectives. In total, we then looked at nearly 400 indicators and we compared them based on nine criteria. Here it is important to say that the report on mapping one is uh, uh, already available off on the web page of the work stream, as well as uh, um, the report on the canvas in questionnaire. Mapping two, uh, and with regard to mapping two, the report is uh, currently being finalized and we will then uh, disseminate it shortly. Next slide, please. In this slide, you can see an overview of the criteria that we followed for mapping two. These are um, to some extent the same criteria that we um, considered for mapping one, but we also added some criteria that are uh, more specific to indicators. So we then assessed the endorsement by an intergovernmental body, the coverage of more than one objectives of the global compact, and this is a criterion that we added because uh, most respondents to the survey that we uh, conducted in February said that they think uh, that it would be important that indicators are used to the extent possible to monitor progress uh, with regard to different objectives of the Global Compact. We also assess the coverage of more than one principle of the Global Compact. We also checked whether indicators have an agreed methodology because having an agreed methodology and a clear method of computation can um, help to ensure that the indicator is ready to be used um, from, um, from the moment um, of its uh, adoption. We also looked uh, at whether or not indicators are included in more than one indicator frameworks to ensure that uh, um, synergies are leveraged and also that uh, duplications are avoided. Then we um, assess the availability of data by country and by region, as mentioned before, uh, in order to ensure that the indicators uh, um, are relevant in different countries and in different regions of the world. And finally, we also assessed the availability of a time series and also the timeliness of indicators. Um, and based on uh, these uh, two mappings, uh, we identified uh, some um, criteria that um, appear to be particularly relevant for the different objectives of the Global Compact. And I will now leave the floor to Claire so that she could tell us more about uh, how we uh, then passed from this uh, second mapping to the development of the preliminary proposal of a limited set of indicators. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so first of all, let uh, me thank uh, IOM uh, on behalf of DESA for the wonderful collaboration. I don't think we would have managed to make so much progress without such collegiality and, and, and deep understanding of each other. So thank you. I also wanted to thank the network for their uh, unwavering support. And of course, the members of the work stream who've worked extremely hard. Um, as you can see from all the slides uh, Irene has shared, we've, uh, in a few months, we've really done a, a lot of work. We've pushed very hard and the members of the work stream have been incredibly diligent in engaging and providing feedback in very short uh, deadlines and so forth. So kudos to them. Thank you so much. So. From the slides you've seen so far, you can see how complicated this process has been. We've basically been filtering down from all possible frameworks that could be relevant to this limited set of indicators for the proposal. Um, and um, we identified 20 indicators that we consider core. And by that, mean we mean that they're we consider them the most relevant among the ones that we reviewed for the GCM objective, for the specific GCM objective we chose them for. And um, they also fulfill most or all of the criteria that um, Irene identified 
in the mapping too in the previous slide. We also recognize that uh, given the complexity and the scope of the GCM in terms of its objectives, but also the, the guiding principles, um, we needed to have some additional indicators that would provide uh, more in depth perhaps and more contextual information for some of the objectives. So in order to get to that, that initial preliminary proposal uh, from the mappings one and two and the questionnaire that Irene shared in the previous uh, slides, we, um, we actually had an internal process which was quite complex. Um, we um, shared the 400 plus indicators from the mapping two, which were um, clustered by objective with the members of our work stream. And we asked them to select and rank the indicators that they thought were most useful and relevant for each objective. We then conducted four uh, consultations with the members of the work stream, going objective by objective and indicator by indicator, and had quite uh, involved discussions about which ones should be prioritized and why. And uh, we, again, this is the, the, the point that Katie alluded to at the beginning. Uh, the richness of the of the network bringing together the expertise, the technical expertise from colleagues in very different areas. And I think we've benefited immensely from that. Next slide, please. So this graph gives you a sense of sort of a synthesis of how the indicators overlap and how they uh, a little bit of a short introduction. We were going to go into details in the discussion part of this meeting today, but just let me briefly introduce we made the strategic choice because of para 70 to have one or two maximum core indicators per objective. And this is really to stick to the mandate that we stay limited in, 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 our, in our list. Um, we also made sure that the indicators come from indicator frameworks that are um, widely recognized. So 10 of the indicators that are being proposed as core are SDG indicators. Um, Eight are from the MGI indicator framework, and two are in the UN expert group meeting on migration statistic indicators or the IDAC. We can see that of the 20 core indicators, eight of these can also be considered additional for some of the other objectives. So that's, we're trying to be as efficient as possible in the proposal. So not to overburden member states in uh, data collection and um, processing. And for the additional indicators, you can see there's more variability. So they range in number from one to 15, depending on the scope of the objective. Um, many of the indicators, both the core and the additional are multi-purpose, uh, a concept that Irene introduced in the previous slides, meaning that they can be used to monitor more than one objective or to look at more than one guiding principle. And I think one aspect that we're quite pleased with is that, uh, we're really building on existing indicator frameworks. So of all the indicators in the core and the additional, only one, and it's an additional indicator, is new. That means that it's not included in already existing frameworks. And this one was um, added because we really feel that uh, <clears throat> the scope of the objective required something uh, a little bit, unfortunately, that's not already available in, in the existing indicators. And we will uh, be, be considering that when we get into the discussion. Uh, next slide, please. So this, uh, these two graphs, which are included in the discussion note that was shared with you uh, from the network secretariat, gives you sort of a, a visual representation of the number of indicators uh, per objective and per guiding principle. And you can see the, the dark blue uh, area represents the core indicators, whereas the lighter blue shaded area represents the additional. And as, you, as I mentioned in the previous slide for the core, they're pretty homogeneous in terms of one or two per, per, uh, per objective, but there is quite a bit of diversity for the uh, for the additional indicators for the for the um, objectives with objective two, seven and 16 having considerably more indicators being proposed. And that again reflects the scope of those objectives. And I think for the guiding principles, you can also see there's a bit of a, a skewed distribution at the moment in terms of the number of indicators. We have 
have um, a fairly high number of indicators that both core and additional that um, are relevant for the guiding principle of being child sensitive or gender responsive. We're um, a little bit lacking on some of the indicators that might respond to the principles of whole of society approaches, national sovereignty and the rule of law. So this is something in our discussions as we move forward and we try to refine the proposal that we might wanna also pay attention to how to improve in some of those areas. Next slide, please. So as Irene mentioned at the introduction of the presentation, one of the deliverables in the context of our program of work for this year is to conduct a number of consultations with member states and stakeholders. And the purpose of these consultations is to ensure that the proposal of the limited set of indicators is really useful and fit for purpose. And it has to be both at the global level and at the regional level. So uh, the uh, five regional consultations that we've been conducting this week and of which today is our last <laughs> are, are really an important milestone for us for uh, getting feedback uh, from you to make sure that what the work stream is developing in terms of a proposal is indeed something uh, that you will be able to use. We will then conduct three global uh, consultations in the fall, uh, which will involve member states and stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. So this is my last slide. It concludes the presentation. And I just wanted to give you a sense of the next steps so that you can also see how you can continue to engage in the process going forward. So next week, uh, the, ne the network secretariat will be sharing with you an online questionnaire where you will be able to provide feedback in writing on the uh, proposal that has been in front of us today. And uh, you will be able for each uh, objective to comment on the core and additional indicators, whether they're relevant and so forth, and also propose uh, um, changes or additions. We will then have the, uh, in the fall, we will have um, these global consultations that I mentioned. But before that, on the basis of the regional consultations this week and your feedback from the questionnaire, uh, the work stream will revise the, the proposal that's in front of us today, and it will be a second version, essentially. And that is going to be the basis of the discussions at the global, um, at the global consultations. And after those, again, the proposal will be revised, taking into account the feedback received, and we will arrive towards the end of the year, late 2023, at having a final version of the revision, which will be um, shared with the executive committee for their consideration. So that gives you a sense that there are many opportunities today. Of course, this is, we're very much excited to looking forward to your feedback, but also through the questionnaire and through the global consultations in the fall. So thank you very much. Um, I give back the floor to the, the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for this uh, amazing presentation to both of the speaker, to Ms. Schoberger and to Ms. Uh, Menotti. Uh, I think it was extremely informative for all of us to see how the process uh, took place. Um, and I think we all have to congratulate you for the huge work that was done and the excellent results that we already achieved. Thank you very much also for guiding all of us through the next steps and through the, uh, through the agenda for the next uh, a few months in order to finalize the list of indicators. Uh, now, dear, uh, dear audience, dear participants, uh, I would like to give the floor, and it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker that I mentioned earlier, Ms. Ellen Percy Crowley from the Colgate University and International Union for the Scientific Study of Population. Ms. Uh, Ellen is a professor emerita at Colgate University, New York, USA. She chairs the scientific panel on international migration of the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population. During 2019, she held the Willy Brandt Guest Professor in International Migration and Ethnic Relations, Malmo University, Sweden. And she's also the former editor of the International Migration Review, uh, and is co-editing the 60th anniversary issue of the journal Tuka. 
Last but not least, she co-edited the demography of refugee and forced migration with Mohammad Jalal Abazi Shabazi and Graham Hugo. Today, she will provide us with the regional perspective of the challenges and opportunities associated with developing the limited set of indicators for monitoring the implementation of the GCM. With this being said, dear Ellen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Oksana. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. We are indeed at the end of a very, very active week of regional consultations. Gratitude and admiration must be expressed and extended to our colleagues in the UN Network on Migration Secretariat, Secretariat the UN DESA, and the Population Division, and IOM GIMDAC in making this process so transparent, an ongoing process that is fundamentally consultative creative and highly respectful, and then iterative based on these consultations. The mapping criteria established by the team, particularly those of timely, uh, timeliness and availability of time series data, reflect the dedication of our colleagues in the work stream to robust and relevant standards for international data and evidence pertaining to the implementation of the Global Compact for Migration. Our colleague Keiko Ozaki Tomita in the consultation for Asia and the Pacific recalled the exciting moments culminating in the Global Compact for Migration together with the Global Compact for Refugees in 2018. And I think as Claire has described with the extent of the work, this push through over this past year in measuring progress toward the implementation, laying that groundwork, we are again experiencing excitement and certainly analytic momentum. Um, our colleague, Padi, Sinyanga Knudsen from the Global Research Forum on Diaspora and Transnationalism said, expressed with such a smile earlier this week that this is a monumental moment or series of moments, and I couldn't agree more. I feel honored to be a part of it. And this moment reflects the admirable leadership of member states, of you, and national statistical office leadership, as well as engagement throughout civil society. In the regional consultation for Africa held on Monday, our colleague Diego Iteralde called for an integrated perspective on the role of international migration and population movements in national statistical accounting systems. That includes census taking, national as well as subnational surveys, civil and vital registration systems, as well as administrative statistical systems. And this makes me feel both young and old at the same time and a little bit teary, having worked in 1985 on the preparation of a technical report for the statistics division of the UN called Consolidated Statistics on All International Arrivals and Departures. Truly, we, you as present and future leaders, are acting on a process whose origins can be traced to 1891. I'm not that old, <laughs> but that far back, and the recommendations of the International Statistical Institute for multilateral efforts to coordinate the collection of international migration data. So I'm humbled by your presence here as statistical and policy experts from throughout Europe and North America. And I can only serve in the next few minutes to raise some issues and questions for our discussion of how this regional context, our regional context is reflected in the process of selection of indicators for the implementation of the C GCM and to be begin to shape the system of indicators accordingly. In her comments yesterday for the region of Latin America, our good friend Marcella Saruti asked why and for what purposes a delimited um, system of indicators. She identified two essential objectives. On the one hand, to improve the review of progress in the implementation of the Global Compact, and on the other, to generate periodic, consistent, and comparable information to inform empirically reliably, validly, migration and migrant policies and programs. 
having information on the implementation of the compact should not be understood only as an obligation towards the international community and migrants themselves, but as a policy instrument at the national level and in the regions of Europe and North America at the subnational, municipal, and local levels as well. Throughout this indicator selection process, the involvement of states and stakeholders in the discussion about what is considered necessary, what we're doing this morning to account for our migratory realities is and will be essential. And Katie, I loved your phrase, I wrote it down, to make migrant stories, make them visible and make them heard. I think that's a, a wonderful image that you've created. Within Europe and North America, partnerships within civil society and the energetic ecosystem of research organizations committed to truthful policy initiatives can and will enhance, amplify the significance of the realities of migration. And our colleagues in the project quantifying migration scenarios for better policy have expressed this as the stylized facts of migration. In considering the key features of migration in Europe and North America, we observe the legacies of high levels of international migration reflected in high proportions of international migration stock. The scale of immigration is related to high proportions of emigration, though less well-documented and understood, certainly less well-documented and understood in the case of the United States. As in the rest of the world, international migration to Europe and North America is largely intracontinental, reflecting labor and professional migration, and in North America, family reunification, but is also distinctively global, with origins of migrants in Asia and increasingly Africa, including resettled refugees. In North America, persons and families seeking asylum and economic security originate from and travel through South and Central America. Displaced peoples and families from Middle, Middle and Western Asia and Africa have sought security in Europe. As throughout the world, migrations to our regions are mixed with migrants motivated by multiple region, reasons which may change over the course of the journey, over the life of migrants and families, over the experiences of migrants and their loved ones, and in relationship to available knowledge and information, and in relationship to opportunities and constraints for agency of migrants in the face of migration control and regulation, as well as within the context of social and environmental change operating at different scales. And again, our colleagues at QuantMeg have provided highly relevant conceptual frameworks in this regard for thinking about migration realities, trajectories, experiences in relationships to drivers and impacts. Um, because of traditions of focusing on so-called per permanent migration and settlement in the United States and Canada, and in Europe, the reception of refugees and asylees are related to the role of migration in social cohesion, political identity at the national, regional, and social scales. So the issues of integration, assimilation, adaptation, social cohesion loom large within our region. And relatedly, the social fact of the relationship between economic processes and workforce needs throughout industrial sectors will certainly remain a strong dimension of policy debate and policy analysis within this region. Generally, the consequences of international migration for society, economy, and polity in Europe and North America loom large in policy debates. That's probably an understatement. Uh, and I suspect the increased attention to the interplay between demographic processes and international migration uh, are going to reemerge as they did in the 1970s with the unpublished work of Ansley Cole. Uh, and now within the current work of, for example, Nick Parr in his recent paper in the um, Population and Development Review, where he looks at replacement migration in relationship to population growth and decline 
throughout countries and regions within Europe. It's a good read on this topic. Certainly a key feature of international migration within Europe and North America is the interplay between migration events, high migration events, and public perceptions about the implications of these events. And note that I say perceptions, perhaps not deep understanding of the evidentiary basis for understanding impacts. So finally, I've been asked for reflections on the relevance of the proposed, the draft system of indicators for this region and considering ways of strengthening coordination throughout national statistical programs. In the regions of Europe and North America, we witness exciting connections between research and educational institutions and statistical and policy offices, as we do increasingly throughout the world. Selfishly, as an educator, I would encourage the aspiration of investment in new generations of migration analysts within government and migration scholars beyond government and interactions between and among sectors. Now, while I observe no uh, obvious omission in the pro proposed system of indicators, I would underscore, as my colleagues have earlier this week, the critical analytic importance of disaggregation for description of trends and patterns in migration regionally and globally. Disaggregation by age and sex, households, migrant status, status lays the foundation for comparative analysis and then engages dimensions of migration selectivity and differentials and the essential comparison of migrants to non-migrants movers to non-movers. These are analytic stepping stones, stones toward explanation and a basis for modeling and simulation, frontiers in which researchers throughout Europe and North America are in fierce pursuit. Um, and here we must embrace the excellent work um, of the expert group on migration statistics in developing sets of indicators aimed at explanation as well as comparison and description. Second, echoing my colleague Marcella Ceruti, migration realities may be humanized with the acknowledgement of the role of human rights, deprivation, violate, uh, violence, conflict, and fundamental insecurity as drivers of migration. Third, attention to the role of migration in workforce policy and social economic integration within the European and North American context points to indicators of education and training, aspirations and the human potential as potentially an important point, a uh, component of the system. Fourth, echoing earlier uh, discussions, we need to anticipate the environmental dimensions of migration. And sh this should be considered complementary to the frameworks for sustainable development goals. On Monday, Raj Barduli uh, urged the micro level analysis of the role of, micro of environmental change in migration decision-making at the local and regional levels. Fifth, among seven, nearly at the end, Within Europe and North America, there are international variation in migration policy debates, and in the case of Canada, increasing local agency in migration policies and admissions. The consideration of innovative measures of a whole of government, whole of society approach is worthwhile, and Claire uh, indicated that this may be an area within the system that we will seek to explore further in the downstream in the work stream. For example, we may engage measures, indicators of the actual ways in which evidence may inform policy making and implementation. Here, qualitative responses from member states may be more meaningful than yes, no responses in the system or scalar responses. We may wanna collect paragraphs here on what, how evidence is actually being incorporated into policy analysis. Shifting scales, we may illustrate the role of data and analysis in bi and multilateral policy development uh, and also policy agreements within the European and North American context. Six, I would also make the case for the development of indicators of exchange of evidence and analysis uh, between government 
and civil society entities. And finally, the dissemination of research using migration scenarios and simulations within the European context fundamentally tests middle range theories of migration and policy interactions and is an illustration of this point of the need for looking carefully at conversations among sectors, public and private, and thinking about the what ifs, thinking about uncertainty as well as the stylized facts of migration. In suggesting these several indicators to chart change in the ways of crafting and implementing data-informed policy, I realize I'm challenging my mother, Marge Percy, who lived over 100 years with a more is more eth uh, ethos, not in terms of things, but in terms of ideas. I ask you only to consider these ideas as provocations, likely naive, to think about better, wiser reflections on the development of this magnificent system of indicators. And I thank you for each of you being present and engaged in, as Patty has said, this monumental moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ellen. This was extremely insightful and interesting for all of us. And I think you have set an amazing ground for discussions for the next session. Uh, I will just probably mention a few of the things that, that really draw my attention. I specifically like how you touched upon the issues of social cohesion and the perception of the population towards various migration issues. I think this is a very actual topic and I see, we see this happening more and more across the region. I also really like you touching upon the environmental dimension of the migration and how you manage to draw uh, the linkages between uh, the need to provide a sustainable integration and inclusion of migrants as a key aspect for social cohesion. And last but not least, the whole of society approach. This is something that I could read as a red line throughout the discussion since the beginning of today's event. Indeed, in order to be able to develop uh, data informed policies uh, and to make sure that we have an impact at the end, we need to have at the table all the relevant stakeholders. And here we mean all migrants, civil society, private sector, governments, you name it. And thank you very much for highlighting that aspect as well. And last but not least, investing in migrant specialists and sharing more information on migration. This is definitely something useful and of relevance in our days. As much as I would like to continue discussing on this topic and, and draw more on the discussions that we had today, I think my time with you today came to an end. And it is my pleasure now to hand over the meeting to Ms. Ram R, the Migration Policy Advisor on International Trade Union Confederation to moderate session two. Thank you very much and have a fruitful discussion today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Oksana. Uh, uh, greetings to all the delegates and, and participants. Um, and also thanks to Catherine for our welcoming opening and uh, to Ellen for the uh, insights uh, she provided for this consultation uh, for, for the region we are covering today. You, you gave us uh, quite a number of food for thought, um, which some of which were captured by Oksana already. Um, as you may have all seen uh, in the agenda for today, uh, during this part of today's consultation, we look forward to receiving your comments and inputs to this preliminary proposal for indicators for the Global Compact on Migration. Uh, before opening the discussion, however, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the uh, colleagues of this work stream, uh, Claire and Irene, not only for their excellent presentations about the process uh, which brought us uh, to this first proposal uh, they have made today and uh, the previous four days, uh, but also for their outstanding work in leading the work stream, along with uh, excellent support from uh, Network Secretariat, in particular Marcia Porras, who I believe also is with us. Um, as introduced, I am from the International Trade Union Confederation, which represents uh, almost 200 million workers worldwide through its 300 plus affiliates in 167 countries and, and territories. 
Um, along with this uh, work stream on indicators, uh, ITUC is a member of three other work streams uh, of the network, uh, considering uh, 245 million uh, migrants of the 272 million uh, are estimated to be of working age. Um, uh, ITUC strong engagement with the global compact and the network for achieving GCM objectives is would not be a surprise. Uh, ultimately, for trade unions, a worker is a worker, regardless of their migration status or other uh, characteristic. Um, we see protection and fulfillment of workers' rights, both in countries of uh, origin, but also in destination, crucial to achieving uh, progress towards GCM objectives. This is, I mean, when we look at the rights violations and abuses faced by workers, um, these are one of the main uh, reasons forcing people to move, even when they do not want to, when they would prefer to stay. Hence the central centrality of um, uh, workers' rights, for, for example, for objective two of the GCM. Uh, but also fulfillment of labor rights for migrant workers is key for many other GCM objectives, including reducing vulnerabilities, empowering migrants, Migrants and ensuring access to decent work and uh, fair recruitment. As such, uh, this process has been uh, very important for us, and we have brought this perspective to the work stream. But of course, the membership included other stakeholders and a diverse group of UN network entities, which uh, ensure the truly richness of perspective and expertise are taken into account when developing this uh, preliminary proposal. Uh, again, uh, kudos to the co-leads and the UN network uh, colleagues. Um, for their inclusive, inclusiveness and flexibility in accommodating all our differing uh, views in this extremely difficult endeavor, despite the limitations and uh, the tight uh, timeline we had, uh, which you have heard uh, during the presentations of uh, Irene and uh, Claire. Uh, before I open the floor for comments and questions from uh, delegations, stakeholders, and, and social partners, uh, I encourage all participants to turn on your cameras when you uh, take the floor. Uh, if you would like to speak, uh, please press the hand button uh, so we can see you. And uh, when taking the floor, uh, please identify yourself, indicating uh, your organizational affiliation, if, if that uh, exists. Um, to ensure maximum participation from a diverse group of uh, audiences here today, uh, I kindly ask you to limit your interventions to a maximum of five minutes. Um, maybe before opening the floor, I mean, what we have taught um, uh, in, in the previous consultations for previous regions, but also for today is to first of all, allow for general comments uh, from uh, with regards to what you have heard in, in terms of the process and the methodology we have uh, taken uh, to, to reach this uh, preliminary um, indicators uh, framework uh, that was shared with you. Um, and I will uh, propose some um, guiding questions we would like to share with you. Maybe if we can move to the second uh, slide, you would see there, uh, so these, uh, our guiding questions, but of course, please don't feel limited. Um, but we would like to hear from you um, your, your um, uh, thoughts around whether the indicators are uh, relevant in terms of their scope, coverage, uh, balance, and ability to compare progress over time and across different countries and regions. Uh, also, if the preliminary proposal aligns well with global frameworks, such as the SDGs, um, but also at the same time reflecting migration dynamics. Uh, and uh, if there are uh, additional specific migration related dimensions that are um, related to the region, sub-regional variations, uh, uh, please raise those so we, we can uh, take them further uh, when, when um, realigning the indicators framework. Um, so with these kind of guiding questions in mind, I would like to ask if there are uh, any um, uh, participants who would like to take the floor for their uh, initial comments, uh, initial reflections. Um, I'm looking if I'm seeing any hands. Uh, I see uh, Jana uh, 
please, the floor is yours. I would kindly ask you to introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, Yana, if you are speaking, we, uh, you, you are unmuted. Uh, you need to uh, unmute. You're muted right now. Thank you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, thanks. Uh, I have some problems with connections, so maybe I'll just uh, keep camera uh we just uh, I'm, I'm my name is Jana Mikova from the uh, delegation of the European union in geneva in the un uh, and uh, from our side from the eu uh, i just wanted to stress, uh, in general uh, our our gratitude for for the work uh, on this in the, uh, in order to give uh, the framework for gestation and to be able to measure progress in a comparable way across the regions. Uh, the result the replies of the questioners confirmed that the points so admitted by the European Commission, especially the importance of the 360 degree approach, uh, that is very important for us. Uh, acknowledge uh, enormous task uh, that has been undertaken uh, that uh, that this uh, this very uh, big task, but a very important task. Uh, uh, we also think uh, that we most overly complicated uh, exercise that no one would be able to important still to keep in mind why the migration governance indicators were developed by IOM in 2016. And, uh, lastly, uh, we have a question. Uh, uh, how uh, uh, would you like to bring these indicators framework together uh, uh, and how would you it will be a very important point for us uh, and we understand the, the the timeline of the process uh, i had some uh, concrete uh, line also because eu is uh, now chairing the platform on disaster displacement uh, we understand that we will be able to put these forward but uh, the questionnaire is open so maybe we will uh, present these uh, at the later stage emphasize uh, big thanks from our side we are very supportive of the process and uh, we are looking forward to engage uh, in more concrete thank you Thank you very much, uh, Jana, for, for your remarks and the question. Uh, before giving the floor to Irene and Claire, I will collect a few more comments. Uh, I see, uh, I believe, a representative from Netherlands. Uh, please uh, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. My name is Milena Senja. I work for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands in The Hague. Um, first of all, I would like to ex express my appreciation for the work that has been done and the progress that has already been achieved towards the development of the GCM uh, indicator framework. Uh, I imagine reviewing and assessing uh, all the existing indicator frameworks and selecting only a handful of relevant indicators to track progress on the GCM uh, is not an easy task, so I thank you for the efforts that have been done. I would also like to thank you for organizing this meeting and for offering the opportunity to uh, provide input on a preliminary proposal. Uh, at the same time, uh, the timing of this meeting has not yet allowed for extensive consultations um, due to the summer period, uh, nor have we been able to consult with all the relevant um, uh, other parts of our administration. Uh, so we therefore appreciate the opportunity to be able to provide written feedback um, to the proposal through a questionnaire. Uh, however, if the deadline will be in August, then this will uh, might still not allow for these consultations due to the summer period. So uh, I was wondering how you view um, th that process and that timeline and if an extension of the deadline might be um, possible beyond the month of August. Um, there are a few other general comments I would like to make and questions to ask about the preliminary proposal. 
Um, so first of all, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the difference between the core indicators and the additional indicators, um, because we um, acknowledge that making this distinction could be very helpful to keep the list digestible and simple, um, but it's not completely clear yet what the practical implications uh, implications of this distinction will be uh, in terms of what it means for reporting uh, by member states on these uh, indicators, if it means a difference in importance of the indicators and, and therefore also a difference in what will be required in terms of reporting. Um, this brings me to the next point, which is related to that, which is regarding the uh, distribution of, of indicators um, between SDGs and, and the other frameworks. Um, because we see that the majority of the core indicators has been derived from the SDGs, which are, of course, crucial to the global compact on migration. But at the same time, migration governance is, of course, um, broader as well. Um, and in our view, there are a few uh, MGI indicators classified as additional indicators that could actually also be relevant enough to qualify as core indicators. Um, for example, the MGI indicator under Objective 1 and also under Objective 11, just to make two examples, but we will also be able to provide this in uh, written feedback in more detail. Um, and then I was also wondering if you could elaborate on what you think the influence of having this indicator framework will be on the upcoming IMRF. Um, of course, it's very difficult for this set of indicators to cover the whole comprehensive scope of the uh, global com compact on migration. Um, and we can imagine that um, these indicators will become quite central to the discussions. So therefore we think it will be extra important to um, stay true to the original text of global compacts on migration in the development of these um, indicators. And one final point I would like to make is regarding the inclusion of migrant voices and perspectives, which was also indicated as a priority in the questionnaire. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate on how this will be considered um, in the final proposal. So thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to ask these questions and we look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, as well for your comments and these very pertinent questions. Uh, I'm just waiting for a few seconds to see if there are other hands um, at this point. Uh, after this session, we will move on to uh, discussing one by one um, the, the core indicators that are uh, being proposed for each objective. But at this point, if you have uh, general remarks, please raise your hand. Uh, and I see uh, Stefan from IC, uh, ICMC. Please, Stefan, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, first, I wanted to congratulate the team because it's really very, very impressive work. And I think we are very much uh, uh, on target. And I think uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the, the, the final product, but indeed very impressive work. Uh, some general uh, uh, comments, and then I will have comments afterwards on some specific uh, objectives. Um, uh, I noted that out of the, um, the, the core indicators, almost 60% of them start with whether or not, which means that uh, the answer is usually very simple, it's yes or no. So it means that there is definitely a need to have either to rephrase it a little bit or to make sure that there are follow-up questions because it will be very difficult to measure the progress on the implementation only based on whether or not. Uh, I mean, all these questions are important, but it's just that they have to be complemented. Uh, I also noted that there is no indicators related to budget. We, we understand that a budget is probably uh, the most explicit document uh, produced by a government where you see the priorities. So for example, uh, when we talk about inclusion, is there any budget line about inclusion, which also show how seriously the government would uh, take uh, inclusion. Another uh, area where there is no in indicator, uh, unless I'm mistaken, is the whole judiciary. Uh, I think it's good to have, for example, a piece of legislation, but it's very important to see how that piece of legislation is being implemented, whether you have court cases, etc. For example, how many hate crime cases 
you may have what would be the jurisprudence, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all for my, my general comment. Thank you very much, Stefan. Again, uh, very, very uh, important comments. Um, I do not see any further hands, uh, so I kindly ask um, uh, either Claire or, oh, I, I see more <laughs> hands now. Uh, I have taken three comments now. I'll take these two as well and then uh, pass the floor for, for uh, reaction by Claire and Irene. Uh, I think Helena, uh, Helena, you are the first uh, to raise your hand. Yes, thank you. I am Elena Olea from Alianza Americas. And I think these first guiding questions are quite pertinent because the greatest challenge that we have, which really applies to this region is the fact that most uh, migration flows come from other regions. So I think that the question about inter-regional migration is critical to understand how these indicators are going to be dialoguing with the indicators that are going to be produced in uh, the countries of origin and, of course, countries of, of return or deportation of many of these migrants. So I think that uh, I, I think we should be thinking specifically about that and about whether the information is uh, actually available and updated in many of those countries so that the indicators can be produced and are useful. And I also want to echo Estefan's comment, which we made yesterday in the Latin American consultation about uh, the question of the usefulness of indicators that, that have the dichotomic vi uh, variables such as yes or no. I think that we the questions we should be asking are how many, uh, what, what is being the impact of a specific policy, how many persons it has reached, rather than simply yes or no. A discussion of whether a policy or a legislation has been enacted is insufficient if we don't know about its practical application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, again, also bringing uh, from the previous um, consultations, uh, very useful. Uh, and and uh, last, I give the floor to Paola from uh, Women in Migration Network. Paola, floor is yours. Thank you, Irem. Um, well, I, I excuse me because I have a, not a very good internet connection, so I won't open my camera. And well, I, as Irene said, I represent the Women in Migration Network, which is a civil society organization. And we are also part of the gender work stream of the United Nations Network on Migration. And I want to raise uh, the importance of uh, sex disaggregation of indicators that Professor Ellen Percy uh, mentioned in her presentation today. Uh, but I think also indicators should go beyond disaggregation and uh, also account the progress on gender equality in migration policies and, and the impact of, of gender equality policies in, in, in migrants. Uh, so I think we, well, yesterday we made a similar comment at the Latin American consultation and I know that the indicators work stream uh, has taken this recommendation and will work on uh, implementing or uh, including further uh, indicators to account on gender equality. And we are happy to collaborate with this work stream. And we hope both the gender work stream and indicator work streams will work together to achieve this. Uh, in order to have a larger gender indicators or gender responsive indicators in the revision of the proposal. Uh, but we also think that uh, it's, it's important to take into account uh, that migration might be absent uh, in indicators of gender equality, in general indicators of gender equality. Uh, for example, the indicator that refers to the existence of a legal framework to promote, implement, and monitor equality and non-discrimination on the basis of sex does not ensure that the intersection between gender and migration will be taken into account. 
So in other words, a law or policy promoting gender equality may not take into account the specific situation of migrant women. And this absence will not be reflected in, and in the, the proposed indicator SDG uh, 511. Um, and the same thing happens to the existence of laws and regulations to guarantee equal access of men and women to sexual and reproductive health, uh, which is the SDG indicator 562. Um, however, we want to underscore the importance of inclusion of sexual and reproductive health indicators. And we think that uh, it is important to be taken into account uh, when, uh, when we talk of uh, the inclusion of uh, health indicators or basic rights uh, indicators uh, in the case of sexual and reproductive health. Um, we also congratulate the existence of an indicator on the level of compliance with labor rights uh, based on ILO standards. And we consider uh, that uh, it is important to also uh, make a reference to the ratification and implementation of ILO conventions uh, 189 and 190. Uh, and the, uh, also I want to ask the moderators or the panelists uh, to um, uh, explain what has been the criteria uh, to uh, identify the, price, uh, the guiding principle of gender responsiveness in the selected indicators. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Paula. Uh, again, also for bringing the the gender uh, perspective to to the discussion. Um, I believe Helena's hand is from the previous one. So uh, with this, I, I uh, kindly ask uh, Claire um, and uh, Irene to to respond to these uh, first five um, uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irem, and uh, thank you to all uh, the colleagues who took the floor. Um, and um, I will try to uh, provide some responses, and, and then we can build on them also as we go forward and focus on the panels on the specific uh, objectives and indicators for the um, those objectives. So uh, first of all, um, in terms of the questionnaire and its time timing in terms of when the deadline will be, we are conscious that these meetings, the consultations this week um, are coming at a difficult time for many of you, uh, including the delegations. Um, and so the, the deadline is supposed to be um, the second week of September. Uh, so we hope that gives you enough time to coordinate your responses and um, also uh, ha have the opportunity to enjoy a little bit of a rest in the summer. Um, in terms of the question about the difference between core and additional, um, I think uh, one of the uh, issues that was challenging for us because of the mandate from Para 70 to have a limited set um, was really to identify for each objective which was mo the most comprehensive and the most relevant to its entire scope. But as you know, uh, many of the actions underneath the specific objectives and so forth require uh, more focused or detailed measures. And so the additional, some of them are actually uh, perhaps more uh, more relevant, but but they don't cover the whole breadth of the objective to the extent, same extent. Um, so that's one of the the aspects which differentiates core uh, from additional. The other is the metadata. So the uh, availability of data, the existence of an agreed methodology, the availability of a time series, uh, and so forth. These are criteria that are very important because. As you know, and I think that also relates to the question about uh, the IRMF, IRMF <laughs> sorry. Um, in order for these uh, indicators to be useful, they need to be available already. And many of them have to be already collected and so forth so that you can, if you wish to use them, you know, uh, it's uh, they're being proposed for your consideration if you wish to use them that they are already something that um, it, it can be used. Uh, new indicators, um, which are of course uh, very um, 
important as well. The, the challenge is that in many cases, uh, the process of developing the methodology and collecting the data uh, would require um, years, um, and it would also have to be validated and agreed upon, and that, that might delay the process. And that's the, why we're also emphasizing existing indicators um, and uh, indicators that are included in frameworks that have been endorsed through an intergovernmental process, such as the SDGs or the UN Expert Group Meeting on Migration Statistics Indicators. Um, the question on the MGI uh, indicators being additional, as you can see, many of the um, additional indicators are also core <laughs> for some objectives and vice versa. Um, but the specifics about whether some of the MGI indicators, there are eight at the moment that are uh, being proposed as core uh, for specific objectives could be elevated to core. I think that's something where your feedback to the questionnaire would be very helpful in guiding that. The question on the yes, no for the policy questions coming from the MGI and from the SDG indicator 1072. This is something that we've uh, been discussing throughout the week. It's a, it's a complex question um, and there are pros and cons <laughs> of both uh, approaches. We know that a simple yes, no answer uh, only skims the surface and does not give information on the implementation or the impact of a policy. Um, however, you also have to understand that um, the, uh, the, this limited set of indicators, it's very difficult to go into detail about how a policy is designed uh, who it's targeted to reach, the impact it has on those people, which would require a much more complex uh, monitoring mechanism uh, than, than a one indicator probably. Um, so it's a question of balance. And the one of the ways we're trying to address it is by having a linkage between the core indicators and broader indicator frameworks such as the MGI. Uh, so for example, um, if there is one question included in, in, in this proposal, it actually connects to a broader set of much more articulated and, and complex questions, which then provides a more holistic and full picture. Um, so to think of it as kind of a, um, a stepping stone or a bridge between uh, a limited set of indicators and a much more detailed one. And again, the idea being that um, this is a, uh, a, a proposal that's being uh, put forward for consideration by member states, but we know that um, there are a lot of excellent frameworks out there that will be used to complement the information that's in the in the proposal, and um, they should be viewed as uh, complementary and 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 mutually um, supportive. Um, the question on gender, we uh, we had the wonderful intervention from Paula yesterday as well, and I think the perspective of making sure that the indicators put forward are not simply disaggregated by sex, but also are really gender responsive is critical. Uh, one of the members of the work stream is also um, actively involved in the work stream on gender. Um, we need to ensure that that voice is really um, heightened so that we, we, uh, we reflect that. Some of the indicators that you mentioned from the SDGs that are um, under uh, the the goal related to gender equality are indeed um, relevant and were considered. Some of them are also included in the uh, UN expert group meeting on migration statistics. Um, and again, in the questionnaire, you can uh, please feel free to provide your, your feedback and also to, uh, to the membership of the work stream as we move forward. Um, the migrant voices, I think that this is critical. We need to ensure that we really respect the spirit of the global compact in terms of the whole of government, whole of society that we ensure coordination um, and that we have those voices reflected. Again, part of the way that we reflected in the generation of the proposal is through the membership of the work stream, which is very diverse and includes uh, voices from diaspora organizations, civil society, uh, trade unions, international organizations. Um, we, we are open to listening to your suggestions also of how to do a better job to make sure that the voices of migrants come through in the proposal. Um, so I think this gives some sort of uh, general uh, reaction to some of the comments and I very much look forward to the, the detailed discussions on the specific indicators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire, for this uh, detailed response. Um, I, I look at Irene, if uh, she would like to come in. Um, otherwise, we can, I suppose, move on to the first panel. 
Um, Yes, okay. So in, in this panel, we will be looking at uh, the five uh, objectives, um, which are objective two uh, concerning minimizing adverse drivers of migration, uh, objective five, which concerns uh, regular pathways, uh, six on recruitment, uh, fair recruitment and decent work, uh, 12 on uh, screening and referral uh, processes, and 18 on skills development and recognition. Um, if we uh, move on to the next uh, slide, we will see the core indicators proposed for each of these um, five uh, objectives. And um, as you will see, except 18, uh, we have uh, two core indicators uh, proposed for each. I will quickly read through them because uh, we have interpretation and I suppose it would be useful for, um, uh, for, for uh, non-English uh, speaking participants. Uh, so for objective two, we have um, an SDG um, 852 uh, indicator proposed, which is on unemployment rates by sex, age, and persons with disabilities. Uh, and the other one is from the MGI framework, which is uh, whether or not the national migration strategy addresses migration linked to environmental degradation and the adverse effects of climate change. Uh, when we look at objective five, uh, so on regular pathways, uh, we see uh, that both uh, indicators are from SDG 10.7.2, uh, again, asking the question whether there is a national policy or strategy for regular migration pathways, including labor migration, uh, or um, uh, the other one is on whether there's, uh, there are measures to foster cooperation among countries and encourage stakeholder inclusion and participation in migration policy. In uh, relation to objective six, so um, decent work and recruitment, uh, we have SDG 8.8.2, which is the uh, indicator on level of national compliance with labor rights uh, based on ILO textual sources. Um, and, and this is desegregated by sex and migrant status. And uh, the other one, again, from the SDG framework on the recruitment costs borne by employee as a proportion of monthly income earned in the country of destination. Uh, objective 12, uh, we have one SDG, one MGI uh, indicator. Uh, one is concerning um, whether the government has migration information and awareness raising campaigns. And the other one concerns uh, whether uh, there are clear and transparent rules and regulations regarding migration. Um, and lastly, on um, uh, skills development and um, recognition, so objective 18, uh, whether or not the government facilitates the recognition of skills and qualifications acquired abroad. Again, this is coming from the SDG um, indicators framework. Um, with this, I think we will leave this slide uh, here on the screen, um, and we look forward to receiving your uh, specific inputs around these objectives and these core indicators um, uh, that are being proposed as part of the preliminary uh, proposal. Uh, I, I look to see um, uh, hands uh, for, for any inputs. Uh, dear Raj, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Um... Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Raj Badawil from the Global Research Forum on Diaspora and Transnationalism. Um, I want to address my question to, uh, to objective number five, which deals with uh, uh, legal pathways. As one of the speakers before said also, when, when you ask a question whether or not yes and no does not help us. And here I'm proposing that in, since the whole objective of GCM is to, to ensure that legal pathways are created or diversified, is there a way that instead of saying, do you have those legal path, do you have a policy for that? Is there a way we can say, what are the additional legal pathways or what is the diversified pathways that your government 
in the last five years or whatever, or six years or two years and so on, have created. And this will give us an indication as to, currently there is a policy because whether you have a policy or not doesn't help. But if you say, has the number, have the number of pathways been increased over the last two years or since, since the introduction, since the passing of the GCM, this will give us an indication that yes, there is a policy to increase legal pathways. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Raj, for this uh, this comment. Uh, I see uh, Stephanie Sepulveda uh, from AFLCO. Stephanie, floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Sepulveda. I'm here representing the American Federation of Labor Council of Industrial Organizations, the AFL-CIO, uh, which is a federation of national uh, labor unions that represent 12.5 million working people in the United States. Um, every day, I think trade unions work to kind of better the lives of workers. Um, and we do that regardless of, you know, their origin, their immigration status. Um, and we see immigrants as a core part of the labor movement. Um, first, I wanted to start by saying that we really commend the great amount of work and effort that has gone into this process. It is a Herculean effort to kind of figure out, you know, using such um, definite indicators uh, to kind of explain uh migration, which is such a complicated problem that um, arises out of many different factors. Um, one thing that we will say is that we strongly believe that migration policy has to be first and foremost a rights-based approach um, and that the indicator should reflect that concept. Um, so one thing that uh, we always want to emphasize is that workers' agency is fundamental to achieving fair migration and decent work for all. We know that a lot of things that migrants have in common is their desire to uh, work uh, and have a job that is fair um, and that gives them access to uh, decent wages um, and a uh, decent lifestyle. Freedom of association uh, to that end is an enabling right that shifts power dynamics so that workers, right, can um, advance their interests, can protect themselves, um, and can reverse kind of those entrenched patterns of discrimination and exploitation that oftentimes are drivers of migration, um, including abuse of migrant workers and exploitation of migrant workers, which we know is so prevalent across the world. Um, so to that end, whether or not a country respects and complies with the universal rights, such as freedom of association and collective uh, bargaining um, is essential to many of the objectives in this uh, section in particular. Um, so objective two and five and six currently have um, SDG 882, which uh, has to do with the lever of compliance with labor rights, freedom of association, collective bargaining based on ILO standards, and we commend that. Uh, we do think that uh, even objective um, 18, the skills and development recognition, uh, could uh, have uh, SDG 882 uh, related to labor rights and freedom of association because we know that trade unions um, currently and historically um, have been uh, there to welcome migrants, to provide training, capacity building, and to provide a path to decent work uh, for migrants, both in countries of origin, right, as a way to, you know, uh, give uh, individuals access to pathways to better their work opportunities through training programs, apprenticeship programs, and also in countries of destination. Uh, trade unions, for example, in the U.S., um, have collaborated with community groups and continue to do so to, you know, welcome migrants into their ranks and to give them access to, uh, you know, the development of skills that lead to work that is fair um, and that allows them to live a life of dignity uh, in their country of destination. Uh, and then one more thing I'll add is that in the regular pathways section, I see that um, as a G1072, uh, regarding, you know, temporary protection for those who are forcibly displaced uh, as an indicator of, of regular pathways. Uh, we commend that it's there. We might suggest that it moved to be a core indicator. Uh, we know that with the um, increased, uh, you know, conflict, 
climate disaster, et cetera, that's going on around the world. Uh, the possibility for workers to kind of have expand their humanitarian pathways um, and rather than just focusing on secular pathways of labor migration um, is essential uh, to ensure kind of the protection of migrants who are forcibly displaced. Um, and so uh, thinking about uh, in the regular pathways uh, objective, uh, not just, you know, circular migration, but whether or not countries um, have easily accessible uh, labor and, uh, excuse me, not labor, but humanitarian pathways uh, that are in compliance with international law, I think would be would be essential and ensuring that we can quantify whether these pathways are permanent, uh, because we believe that um, these circular migration pathways that sometimes are used as indicators to determine whether or not there are regular pathways, um, oftentimes leave workers kind of in a, a loop of exploitation and abuse where they can't uh, you know, pursue a life uh, with their families that's stable and that has access to decent work, but rather exposes them to the abuse of employers who would like to take advantage of a vulnerable population. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for, for raising these uh, pertinent points. I see uh, Marta, hand, hand of Marta up. Please, Marta, you can take the floor. Yes, hello. My name is uh, Marta Salazar. I'm from Guomi, Women Migrants in Denmark. I have uh, three remarks, which I did yesterday also at the Latin American, uh, uh, the Latin American talk. One is about the climate indicators. Um, Wobi is working with gender migration and climate justice. And in that regard, we need, a, we, we, we make clear that indicator um, could be, uh, this is only a the, one of many possibilities of uh, a, on climate uh, finances. It should be a gender, uh, gender responsive climate finances. So if we have some numbers, some uh, gender, uh, gender lines on every indicator, we can see if there are any progress or not. Otherwise, uh, the many responses will only say yes. For example, if they can give us clear uh, responses on the last three years on the budget lines on gender um, um, in regarding to uh, climate, we will see if they are considering, for example, uh, according to the IPCC, the risk uh, of maladaptation and uh, losses and damages, for example. The second one uh, I want to mention is um, the uh, due diligence in law, which is also should be also applicable to um, uh, to uh, the migration laws. Due diligence uh, usually is when you are going to uh, for for trade agreements. We want some certainty in these laws, which are um, very unclear for many migrants, especially migrant women. Uh, and the third one, I will, I will come back to that, is regarding of trafficking of women. We also would like to have some uh, gender, uh, gender lines, gender, gender in the budget lines, so we can see is it, is it, is it going somewhere. Otherwise, it's criminalizing and revictimizing uh, many, many women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta, uh, as well. Uh, I, I believe um, we are uh, slightly behind uh, our schedule, so uh, I will kindly ask Alma and uh, our, our um, participant from Justice in Motion uh, to please wait for the uh, next round, uh, but I will definitely call, call up on you and give you the floor. Um, uh, but um, I would like to allow Claire uh, and or Irene to respond to these first uh, comments, uh, and then we'll move to the second panel, but you're, you're welcome to also um, uh, put your input uh, in relation to these first uh, set of um, uh, objectives. Uh, Claire, uh, or Irene, uh, can I please uh, invite you to respond to the first uh, set of inputs? Yes, thank you, Irene, and also thank you very much to the participants who have uh, raised uh, these questions and made these comments. Um, such uh, input and such uh, ideas are very important for us, and this is exactly what we would like to hear from you today. So many thanks. Uh, 
um, I will try to address the main points that were raised. Uh, um, so with regard to the uh, indicators that for CIS and no answers and that uh, are uh, referring to the existence or not of uh, policies and strategies uh, and the need for both uh, output and outcome indicators. Uh, this is indeed a point that has emerged also in the past uh, days uh, in consultations for other uh, regions. And uh, um, we, we know uh, we note this point and we I think that as a work stream we will uh, further reflect on how to best combine um, um, different types of indicators. Uh, in the past uh, weeks uh, as a work stream we have been reflecting uh, on how we could um, have a combination of different indicators uh, looking uh, both at the existence of policies and strategies and uh, at outcomes in terms of impact in particular. But um, here as well, if you have any uh, suggestions on uh, points where you think that an outcome indicator may be uh, best suited, such as the one that was done by Raj, they are very much welcome um, either today or also in the survey that you will receive next week, uh, and for which we really look forward uh, to hearing from you about uh, uh, your detailed uh, feedback. Then with regard to the uh, labor rights, um, this is also a point that has emerged uh, both uh, this week uh, in consultations and also has been very much present uh, in our consultation as a work stream. Um, as a work stream um, um, we had the pleasure to have in our membership uh, uh, the International Trade Union Confederation, which you also uh, see represented today, um, which has uh, brought forward some of these uh, points. We also had the ILO uh, participating in the work stream, and therefore these uh, points have been very well represented and also very much uh, discussed. And uh, well noted on your suggestion to also consider the SDG indicator 8.8.2 for um, objective uh, 18, we will consider this. Then with regard to the suggestion uh, uh, to expand uh, the indicators on uh, regular uh, pathways um, um, were noted also. Um, here I would like to point also at the complementarity between the Global Compact on Migration and the Global Compact on uh, Refugees, uh, which also addresses uh, um, some humanitarian act, uh, aspects in particular. And then finally, on the points on uh, gender and climate, these uh, have also been uh, two points that have been uh, very much present uh, uh, in consultations this week um, and also in our discussions as work stream and I think that we will take uh, uh, some time to uh, reflect on how to best uh, address them going forward. With regard to, make, to climate and environment, environmental aspects in particular, um, as you may have seen from the discussion note, we have uh, uh, one core indicator for objective two on uh, um, uh, national strategies addressing environmental degradation and migration, um, but we also have two additional indicators uh, on uh, land degradation and uh, disasters. However, um, well noted on these suggestions and please um, do also include them in your responses to the survey and uh, we will consider them going forward as a work stream. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Irene, for, for your responses uh, to, to the uh, valuable comments made. Um, I think then uh, we can move on to the next uh, panel. Uh, but before reading out the objectives here, I see one comment in the chat, which I will uh, ask. Um, uh, maybe I'll read it out quickly, and then it can be also interpreted um, in, in Russian. Um, so this is a comment from Andrew Fuse from uh, Church World Service in New York, uh, which is part of the Climate Migration and Displacement Platform. And uh, they are pleased to see a potential indicator here that links migration with adverse climate impacts and environmental degradation. Um, and uh, under objective two, uh, but uh, also that could be better fit, uh, he proposes with objective five, uh, since it seems to to relate uh, availability and flexibility of regular pathways for migration and uh, to include an indicator for objective two that addresses 
whether national adaptation plans and other climate risk mitigation policies reflect migration and human mobility impacts. Um, I suppose he's uh, proposing this as, an, as a potential indicator. Um, and uh, thank you for, for posting your, chat, uh, your, your comment, uh, Andrew. Um, so for panel two, uh, we will look into uh, objectives uh, four, eight, nine, 10, 11, 13, and 21. Um, uh, the, the objective four is on legal identity and documentation, eight, uh, saving lives. Um, so uh, during the migration uh, program, process. Uh, nine concerns uh, countering smuggling, while 10 is about eradicating uh, trafficking in, in persons. Uh, 11 uh, about managing borders. Uh, 13 um, uh, developing alternatives to detention. And uh, objective 21 on dignified return and reintegration. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, we can look at the core indicators here. Uh, again, uh, we see quite a few from the SDG framework uh, and uh, MGI, the uh, Migration Governance Indicators, but also from IDAC and um, EGMIS. Um, I will not read this time. I'm wondering if that is okay. Uh, to, to save up from the time uh, and directly uh, go into uh, receiving comments. Uh, I do remember, uh, um, uh, I, I believe Kathleen from Justice in Motion was uh, the first one uh, who had raised hands uh, before we close the free response. So I give her the floor first, thank you. Thank you. My name is Kathleen Karen from Justice in Motion based in New York, and we work on protecting migrant rights across North and Central America. So uh, thank you for the time and thank you for this really extensive and complicated work. I want to first just support my AFL-CIO colleague um, that really endorsed a lot of the comments she made. And then I'm going to make two specific comments here on the last slide about core indicator six, which was about the cost of the the born by the employee has a proportion of the monthly income um, for recruitment. So um, I just wanted to say that any cost that a worker pays to go on the temporary foreign worker visa programs could be a potential indicator of human trafficking and leading into human trafficking. So I wasn't sure um, I'm newer to the, to the indicators in this process, if that was um, kind of a neutral, just a neutral statement as opposed to a positive statement of saying, um, asking if there's no costs of recruitment transferred to employees in the recruitment process, because that would be a strong statement against human trafficking and a positive, very you know, right-centric approach. So that's a comment on core indicator six from the last slide. And on this slide, core indicator 21, a comment about return and um, reintegration it, reintegration of um, returning nationals. So this is um, where the concept that we, the core work of justice in motion is around portable justice, the right and ability of migrants to access justice across borders. This is where it'd be particularly um, applicable because when you have a returning national in the labor migration context, if they have suffered human trafficking or simply wage theft when they were working in another country, the amount of money that they lost that an employer in the country of destination is holding on to and that the money that should be in the pocket of the returning migrant affects their ability to effectively reintegrate into the country of origin. So a good indicator is around access to justice across borders. You know, is there mechanisms by country of origin governments and country of destination to allow workers to access a justice system um, across the borders? So that's that's my comment and thank thank you for your time and this really good interesting work. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Uh, well noted. I uh, will give the floor to uh, Alma, who was uh, also had raised her hand in the first panel. I kindly ask, um, we said five minutes, but I will ask uh, to keep the interventions a bit shorter uh, because of the time constraints. We have two more panels to go through. Thank you, Alma. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alma Makitiko, and I'm with the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights 
in the United States. And uh, first, I want to express my gratitude uh, to all stakeholders who have been engaged in the development of these indicators. Um, uh, and my comment is, is regarding uh, race and ethnicity in, in these indicators. I think that we all know that, that there's serious uh, data and statistics gap in terms of the global and national mechanisms uh, with respect to the nature, uh, the, the patterns and the manifestations of race and racism and racial discrimination towards migrants. And I think that the global compact, the implementation of the global compact will benefit from a commitment to the collection of comprehensive data and statistics in all intersectional forms of uh, and dimensions uh, in areas of, of rights. And what I mean with this is that I think that we really uh, will benefit from collection of statistics regarding uh, discrimination, uh, specifically ethnicity, race, uh, income, uh, gender, age, disability, and whether uh, communities are urban and rural communities, just, just to start. And I think uh, having these uh, collecting this, this data will help us understand better the root causes and the impacts uh, that push people to migrate, uh, will help us understand uh, the impacts also of climatic and man-made disasters and extreme, extreme poverty on specific communities. It will allow us to assess the differentiated impacts of migrants in, in in vulnerable situations at borders. And it will also let us understand the specific um, impacts and manifestations of race and racism regarding uh, migrant deaths. Um, I welcome uh, the indicators that have been, that are being proposed regarding objective eight in terms of uh, the mechanisms for search and identification of migrants. I also think it will be important to um, have an indicator about not only the number of people who have uh, died, but also the number of people who have been found alive. I think that's also important. And regarding the indicators uh, on uh, objective eight, I think it will be important to um, a collect data and information on legal pathways uh, for, for, for migrants. Uh, and also, I think it will be, we must benefit also, we could benefit from the explicit attention of human rights, you know, in the implementation of the global compact and very specifically on, on objective 11. Um, I think that is my intervention. I do see just from a quick revision of the uh, indicators that that labor rights is is, is strong. Uh, I see rights uh, 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 all around the document, but I think that we need a stronger uh, commitment to human rights in all these indicators. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Alma. Um, I give the floor to uh, our colleague from uh, the Working Group Against uh, Trafficking in Human Beings. Uh, yes, hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Thank you. Uh, I will uh, speak on the indicator uh, number 10, uh, or the objective number 10. Uh, my name is Martina Liebsch, and uh, with great respect for the work done so far on behalf of the Working Group Against Human Trafficking of the German uh, Catholic Bishops' Conference, I want to make the following observations. In our opinion, and if I say our opinion, this opinion has been coordinated as well with the German NGO Network Against Human Trafficking, uh, the core indicator is not relevant, at least not relevant enough, to measure progress to combat and eradicate trafficking in persons. In the existing statistics reports about human trafficking, the persons counted are registered victims, the so-called bride field. 
we know that this is only the tip of the iceberg and that the number of unreported or undetected cases is much higher. Registered cases do not say much about the conviction of traffickers, as this depends on criminal norms, resources invested. I want to highlight this, what also Stefan said uh, before, resources invested, the awareness in authorities and how much specialized and trained staff is available. Trafficking is a hugely profitable crime. It will not be eradicated by just counting the registered victims alone. It is important to measure about how much resources are invested in the fight against trafficking in human beings, to what extent a government commits itself to combat trafficking in human beings and supports victims, for example, by establishing action plans, coordination bodies, implementing international directives and conventions, and how much uh, civil society is promoted and funded in victim protection organizations. So we suggest rethinking objective 10 or the indicators of objective 10 and include some of the following. Uh, I will not read them out all. We have a couple of them, but uh, I'll limit myself to six. One is whether or not the state government has trafficking information and awareness raising campaigns similar to the one mentioned uh, under objective three and 12. Two, specific and regular training of border staff, police and judiciary, uh, similar as under objective 11 and 12. Available, so third, available regulations to, fund, uh, to fight money laundering and to seize assets from traffickers. Uh, number four, number of court cases and convictions on trafficking in human beings. Uh, number five, the availability of low threshold exit and rehabilitation measures for victims. And uh, number six, the implementation and accessibility, I think that's important, of victims' rights, uh, social and labor rights, right to claim wages, for example. And sorry, I forgot one. Number seven, whether or not the state has a national action plan on combating trafficking in human beings and supporting its victims. I'm very happy also to provide this more detail in writing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for this input and uh, definitely we encourage please uh, for for the written inputs through the survey uh, to have how to have all the uh, details um, and, and more. Um, uh, Stefan and Marta, I will kindly ask for you to wait for the next uh, panel. Um, apologies for this again, uh, due to the time constraints and uh, I will pass the floor to uh, Claire and uh, Irene, but maybe um, uh, taking uh, this chance, uh, there was the question concerning uh, the trafficking uh, objective uh, 10 um, uh, and, and also uh, the um, uh, core objective proposed under uh, objective six concerning recruitment costs. Definitely, um, uh, the, the idea is the recruitment costs should not be borne by the employee. Mm -hmm. And we do see the link definitely between the these type of costs and trafficking. Mm -hmm. Hence, uh, we have proposed uh, that uh, indicator also under uh, objective 10, uh, but as a as a uh, additional uh, indicator. Uh, so that's why you're not seeing it um, in this in this um, uh, slide. Uh, without further ado, I kindly pass the floor to uh, Claire and Irene for their uh, initial responses to this uh, to these inputs. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to keep it extremely brief so I don't take up time from you so that you can continue making your comments. But um, Irem's point is exactly what I wanted to make as well, that it's uh, it's included as an additional, the recruitment cost under uh, the trafficking objective. Uh, for the um, discrimination, uh, we also have 1031 SDG indicator, which I think is uh, referenced in uh, re under as an additional indicator under a number of objectives. And that looks at the proportion of people who felt discriminated. Uh, but the, the segregation by race is quite a complex 
um, issue and uh, perhaps we could um, uh, elaborate more, but the, the main problem is that statistically there is no recommendation of how to desegregate race globally. So each country has their own approaches. Um, so that might be uh, challenging at a, an, in a global proposal, but it could obviously be very beneficial as an additional way to look at um, discrimination discrimination and intersectionalities at a, at a national level. Um, I wanted to uh, refer to the aspect of access to justice, which is critical at the moment. It is uh, reflected only as a sub indicator in one of the domains of 1072, um, but that's something we could try to perhaps uh, review and elevate to a higher level. And um, I think um, that's all I can add at the moment so, without taking up too much of your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire, for, for the brief uh, response. And that is the case we do want to hear from many of you in terms of your comments and uh, inputs. So um, I would like to uh, directly pass uh, the, uh, onto the next slide uh, to open the third panel, but I will uh, give the floor to Stefan and Marta um, in conjunction with these objectives or the previous ones. So this panel, we will be looking at um, objective 14 on consul protection um, uh, on uh, objective 15, uh, which is uh, concerning access to basic services, 16 on inclusion and social cohesion, uh, 19 on migrant and diaspora contributions, uh, 20 on remittances, and 22 uh, social protection. Uh, if we can go on the next slide to see the core objectives proposed for this, uh, again, uh, for, for the time uh, limitations, I will not go through them all, but you see, again, uh, largely an SDG um, uh, framework indicators um, and uh, also three of them are uh, from the MGI. Uh, for this one, uh, uh, except uh, for 19 and 20, uh, we have uh, only one core indicator uh, for the rest um, of the objectives. Um, I, uh, while waiting uh, for, for uh, other colleagues to digest this uh, slide, maybe I uh, give the floor to Stefan, um, uh, if uh, he still uh, would like to comment uh, either on the previous or this um, set of objectives. Thank you. I'm afraid that I will be commented on both, but I will be very quick. So uh, first on objective eight, uh, I, I noted that there are only two core indicators and they are only on missing migrants and there is no indicator on saving lives, uh, which is very worrying, at least from a European perspective, if we look at the issue of the whole rescue uh, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and I think it would be important maybe to link these um, indicators to the, the budget of rescue operation, because we have seen um, a deterioration in uh, rescue operation, in, in particular linked to decreased budget, and also in operating procedure, SOPs of, uh, um, of uh, the Navy and the uh, Coast Guard, uh, because in, in some cases, uh, some of these procedures are basically preventing people from rescuing uh, migrants. So uh, now objective uh, 15, uh, provide access to basic services. I think it would be important to have an indicator related whether um, health providers or teachers, for example, have a, a, a legal or administrative obligation. Uh, to denounce irregular migrants accessing services, what we call the famous firewalls, uh, but we can frame it uh, differently. Because when people are at risk of being deported, they don't in reality access services. And then uh, my uh, final comment is about objective 21 regarding uh, return. I think it would be important to have an indicator about the, the legal safeguards and due process in forced returns, the human rights dimension of forced returns. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, both for the important comments and also being very quick. Um, uh, Marta, I, I see your hand raised. Uh, if Is that from a previous? Um, 
session or would you like to take the floor? Okay, the floor yeah. is yours. Thank you. I just want to um, go deeper um, on how trafficking is, uh, is linked to the, uh, to the climate change or the climate justice. Uh, it, was, it was appointed by the um, Special Rapporteur on Trafficking, how specifically climate change are drivers of uh, displacement. So in these cases, in many cases, uh, for a gender perspective, many of the issues are driver of migration will be uh, re related to, not one apart from the other. So we're trying to, to put um, uh, WAMI is collaborating with women, women in migration uh, network, which Paula is, uh, is the global, uh, where there are many, and there is also the global alliance against trafficking, pointing out how, uh, how uh, the, the, the legal, the legal uh, emphasis is on, on, on criminalizing uh, the person and not humanizing uh, migration and um, in that uh, I will see I don't see anywhere in the indicators uh, where the uh, where the new narratives are where are the uh, how can because if we have an indicator which is an open on indicator on narratives it will be the the own narratives combating those um, stereotypes especially on the media thank you Thank you very much, Marta. Also, we see you. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I'm seeing uh, Paddy's hand uh, raised. Uh, Paddy from GRF, uh, GRFDT, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Irem, thank you for moderating uh, this session uh, very eloquently and uh, very difficultly so, because I think there's a, a lot of feedback that we're getting. Just to say, I think once again, to thank the co-chairs in this very public space, uh, as GRFDT is a very active member of this work stream for both their openness and inclusion, uh, not just because we're a member of the work stream, but also we're members of other work streams where when even when we haven't uh, had an, some kind of an agreement or some kind of an understanding that we would like to put forward, we're also brought in into the space. So you can see that space being opened up. But I think also noting that we have a number of civil society organizations that would also be joining this particular work stream that uh, Irem and myself and others who are already from civil society are excited about. So thank you to the co-chairs for this. I just thought that it, it was very important, you know, as we were also coming into this space, maybe a quick reaction to some of the comments um, that were being made on this particular panel and very specific, maybe also to, to number 22. I think that has mentioned, I think for us as well, when we came on uh, and looking at this a bit deeply, we thought that it was indeed very important for us to look at uh, social justice in terms of the portability of social benefits um, across borders uh, and, and the diversity of the other issues that are also being raised. And so I think we welcome the comment that is coming in um, uh, from Kathleen. But then I think also when we looked at the indicators that we had on, on migrant contribution and diaspora, uh, so that's 19 and 20. 20, I think you can also see that there is um, there, there would be space for us to provide um, a diversity of, of, of indicators because the ones that we have may not probably serve everything that we need to take care of when we look at monitoring the GCM uh, in terms of what the objectives have set it out to. But again, to just say thank you to the co-chairs and we continue to be active in this space. And thank you once again to all the participants for your very um, fruitful and very rich contributions today and in previous days. Thank you very much, Paddy, um, for, for also uh, responding to some of the comments. Uh, very useful. And uh, yes, um, being together in this work stream has been very enriching um, for us as well. Um, I see no further hands. So for this panel, I, I kindly ask uh, Claire and Irene uh, to, to give uh, their, their um, reaction. Uh, um, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Irene. Thank you very much, Irene. Thank you very much, Mr. Paddy, for uh, your interventions. And of course, to, to those of you who uh, made questions and comments. Um, so with regard to objective eight in particular, many thanks for this uh, point um, and for raising it. We uh, looked at the indicators that are existing and for objective eight, indeed, we didn't, um, we didn't find many. And um, in case uh, you have any suggestions on uh, possible indicators and on the wording, perhaps, uh, please feel free also to, um, to share them, including for the survey and um, 
really look forward to your suggestions. With regard to objective 18 um, on firewalls um, as well, um, please let us uh, uh, know um, any suggestions, and this is very much very well noted otherwise. Um, and the same with regard to the human rights dimension of uh, forced returns and links between uh, climate uh, drive related drivers and trafficking. Then um, I think that with regard to the, the point that is in the chat on social security, Paddy already uh, addressed it. Um, and therefore, uh, um, if this already answers your question, maybe um, I would leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irene. Um, and yes, definitely the, the social security aspects, we have discussed this extensively and also have um, the kind of relevant uh, SDG indicator as also additional indicator under several um, objectives. Um, I would like to move on to the last uh, panel uh, of today um, to look at the last uh, objectives we haven't so far discussed. Um, the objective one concerning data, uh, three on uh, information provision to migrants um, or potential migrants, uh, seven on uh, reducing vulnerabilities, 17 uh, on eliminating discrimination, and 23 on international cooperation. Um, so with regards to these five objectives, the, the um, uh, core indicators that are being proposed as a uh, preliminary under this uh, proposal are, if we move on the next slide, please. Um, you, you see, uh, again, for some of them, we have two core indicators proposed, for others, uh, one, um, and um, I will uh, let you uh, look at these uh, core indicators um, and also consider that uh, there are some additional ones, but uh, we look forward to receiving your uh, initial comments, uh, thoughts around these core indicators or the gaps you see, uh, I mean, particularly for the, for the region we are covering uh, today. Um, so uh, please uh, raise your hands um, if you would like to take the floor. I see no hands um, for this, uh, but again, um, feel free if you think you have uh, comments for the previous panels, uh, for the previous objectives that you would have wanted to share, but um, there was no uh, time to provide your input. Uh, please see this, this last panel as an opportunity to um, raise any issue that you have in mind, uh, any comments, inputs. Um, thank you, Paula. Uh, I see Paula's hand. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, uh, Irem. Um, I wanted to also um, back up well the comment of uh, Alma uh, mentioning uh, the importance of including racial discrimination, and I think it's a it's a challenge uh, when you you are using indicators uh, that are pretty constrained and uh, you cannot reflect the complexity of intersectional discrimination. But I think that uh, we have been working the racial discrimination, the anti-discrimination work stream, um, racial anti-discrimination work stream and the gender work stream. We have been working together to address uh, intersectional discrimination. And uh, I pose this question also to the indicators work stream on how to uh, reflect this more complex uh, realities uh, in the in this set of uh, indicators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, yes, I, I, I suppose also um, from from those work streams, there there could be some uh, input for this as well. Um, I am uh, waiting to see if there are uh, further comments. Uh, if anyone would like to take the floor, I will wait for another minute, uh, maybe, and then um, pass the floor for the final remarks from our um, colleagues um, from UNDESA and IOM, uh, Claire and Irene, and, um, and then we'll have the closing remarks. 
So uh, if there are no further interventions, I just wanted to uh, thank you uh, as IRM has just done. Uh, we appreciate very much your feedback, your engagement. We encourage you strongly to participate in uh, the questionnaire that will be shared with you next week. And in particular, we really want to hear the voice from uh, everybody, but in particular member states who sometimes um, are um, more reluctant to take the floor and haven't had a chance to coordinate uh, their responses. So uh, please engage. This is critical because ultimately uh, the proposal is for your consideration and so it needs to meet your needs. Uh, we are excited about all the engagement we've had this week. I think I was counting. We've had uh, something almost 600 participants um, throughout. So that's an amazing uh, milestone in terms of uh, reaching uh, you, uh, making sure that you uh, are aware of the process and that you're able to engage and hearing your voices. So I think um, we're extremely pleased and grateful and we'd like to thank you for all your engagement and look forward to continuing working together. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, definitely, this uh, five days have been very useful for us to hear uh, the inputs and, and the comments, uh, but we look forward to receiving uh, even more uh, through the survey. Uh, with this, uh, I will um, end the kind of interactive discussion uh, part of this uh, consultation and uh, give the floor to Mr. Bella Hovi, uh, Chief of Migration uh, of the UN uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, Yuan Dessa, uh, to share some key takeaway messages and uh, for his concluding remarks. Thank you very much for all your inputs and, and participation. The floor is yours, Bella. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. We've now reached the end of this last regional GCM talk on indicators. And thank you very much for being with us today and for sharing insights. It's wonderful to see over 80 participants that are online today, member states, other stakeholders. It shows the value of these regional consultations, which are key for ensuring that the proposal for a limited set of indicators will be fit for purpose. And congratulations again to the DESA IOM team and that of the entire work stream for the Herculean work achieved so far. Special thanks to Professor Alan Fraley for a thought-provoking presentation. More generally, let me take this opportunity to express my appreciation for her interest and unwavering support uh, to the work of the UN on international migration at the UN over so many decades. Your presence and contributions ensure that our work continues to be grounded in research and evidence, and thank you for providing a bridge between the global migration policy community and the global academic community. A previous speaker referred to paragraph 70 as groundbreaking and a monumental uh, moment. And, and, and I think that's for good reasons. Let us uh, just remind ourselves for a moment that during the negotiations on the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, member states did consider the issue of indicators for monitoring implementation, but in the end decided not to make this part of the compact. However, four years later, in the context of the negotiations of the Progress Declaration of the first International Migration Review Forum, Member States requested the Secretary General to propose a limited set of indicators. Having had the pleasure to support the co-facilitators of the Progress Declaration, I was delighted to witness this progress. I'm confident that the organizers have taken good note of the many suggestions and comments made. Let me just share a few observations. Two general remarks. We should remind ourselves that the selected set of indicators will only be part of the GCM monitoring framework. We call that paragraph 53 of the Global Compact calls for, and I quote, regular and inclusive reviews of progress at national level, such as through the voluntary elaboration and use of national implementation plans, drawing on contributions from all relevant stakeholders. And let me also reiterate what many people have said, that the GCM is closely aligned with the 2030 Agenda. It's my view that the GCM is in fact an elaboration of the 2030 Agenda in the area of migration, a kind of an extension. And this close connection also applies, as you know, to the respective monitoring frameworks, as is clear from paragraph 70 of the Progress Declaration. 
a thought on the indicators. Uh, my former colleague and good friend Stefan, as well as Helena, Raj, and others, have drawn attention to the indicators which start with does the government have a policy on da da da? And a simple yes or no, they contend, does not allow for us to measure progress. Also, importantly, it does not address the implementation of those policies. That issue was also raised during other regional consultations held this week. Questioning indicators which require, which were questioning indicators that require a simple yes and no. <clears throat> uh, can we reflect outcomes and implementation? Now, I can see two options going forward. First, um, even if the question suggests a binary response, yes or no, the responses could be potentially expressed as a range or a scale. Even if the indicator is formulated yes, no, in terms of measurement, there can be greater nuance, variability, perhaps a sliding scale. But perhaps preferably, we may wish to and look again at some of those indicators in the context, uh, similar indicators in the context uh, of the SDG indicator framework. And for inspiration, let me give three examples. SDG 1211 uh, uh, asks for a number, for the number of countries developing, adopting, or implementing policy instruments aimed at supporting da 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 da. 14C.1 asks the, for the number of countries making progress in ratifying, accepting, and implementing through legal policy and institutional frameworks, da 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 da. And 1610.2 requests for the number of countries that adopt and implement. So clearly, also in the context of the SDGs, this issue of policies was considered, and it was an emphasis on not only adopting policies, but also on the implementation side. <laughs> so in light of the many comments that we have received, I think the team may wish to reevaluate re the formulation of those questions. One or two thoughts on the way forward, or one, one thought only. <clears throat> As the team has reported, we're planning to include the result of this work, the proposal for a limited set of indicators in the SGS report on the GCM implementation next year during the 79th session um, of the GA. Now, member states in particular may want to think strategically about the next steps. So here's my question. Can the GA already approve the proposal at the 79th session in the fall of next year? We call that each year the GA has an agenda item on integrated and coordinated implementation often follow up to the outcomes of major UN conferences and summits in the economic, social and related fields. If the GA approves the proposal next year, the indicators can then already be part of the preparation of the second IMRF to be held in 2026. By contrast, if member states wait until 2026, that is the second IMRF to approve the indicator framework, it will only be applied in the context of the third IMRF to be held in 2030. Now, given that the set of indicators is A, limited, and B, based on existing frameworks, it is my hope and even advice for the GA to already approve the proposal next year. Um, and in adopting the set of indicators, the GA could request to the network to support its rollout not only that, but also to reevaluate perhaps a set of indicators following the second IMRF, including proposal, proposing any adjustments. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, let me thank you again for the insightful discussions today. As already announced, you will soon be invited to participate in a survey through which we will collect detailed written feedback on the preliminary proposal that was presented today. Building on the discussions this week and on the results of that survey, the work stream will then revise the discussion note and prepare an updated version of the proposal. We look forward to discussing the revised proposal uh, with you during global consultations in September and October. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and let me hand back the meeting to the organizers.
Thank you very much, uh, Bella. I believe uh, with this, uh, we are closing this final consultation uh, after uh, four additional days. Um, and uh, once again, thanking you all for the insights and inputs uh, and comments. Thank you very much.